I've probably spoken in Bozeman, I don't know, a half dozen times over the years. Have any of you ever heard me talk here before? Okay, good. I have a fresh audience I can see. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually at the university. So, yeah, good. This will be a fresh audience. Yeah, good. Well, and so since we are all fresh, tell us about your evolution um, in your career and how you went from ecology <coughs> professor in 1979 when you started mm -hmm. to climate scientist. Yeah, that was kind of odd when I think back to it because my training is in forest ecology and I was hired at U of M to teach tree biology. And uh, what happened is right around 1980, Ronald Reagan pushed NASA to start getting into global ecology and NASA didn't know any ecologists. And to my great good fortune, they didn't call me, I was an assistant professor, nobody, but they <laughs> called my old major professor at Oregon State and said, we need to talk to ecologists about how to do global ecology. And he being a really pure tree physiologist said, well, you don't want to talk to me, but I have a, a recent student that is just prime for you. And he sent my name in, and so I started in 1981 with NASA. And when I ended, I was chair of the NASA Earth Science Advisory Committee. So from the bottom to the top in 40 quick years. <laughs> and so when did climate science become part yeah. of your research? Yeah, well, let me start by when did it become part of the national conversation um, and basically as everybody heard of the famous Keeling curve and I need a good test of um, okay the Keeling curve is the measurement of atmospheric carbon dioxide that was taken on the top of Mauna Loa out in Hawaii and Keeling started this in 1957 just out of pure curiosity is CO2 going up in the atmosphere, and nobody had any idea back then. Well, he started in 57, and by about the mid-70s, it was clear CO2 was going up, no question about it. And it was also clear that the only place it could be coming from was human burning of fossil fuels. And so as you got to around 1980, the very first the very first, uh, I guess, inkling in the public sphere and in, in, in national journalism about global ecology as a topic it was just getting started. And so I, you know, I came along as a young ecologist. And what uh, got me in was my early computer modeling. I didn't know a thing about satellites, but I was a, a, a needy a computer model. And so they were just saying, well, how can we study the whole world? Ecologists up till that point had studied small areas. In fact, 10th hectare plots was the standard measurement regime. And so nobody had an idea, how could we study the entire planet? And so that's what we just slowly, over decades, figured out how to do. And, um, and uh, what really, what really blew the climate change topic wide open was in 1988, Al Gore, who was a senator at the time, had Jim Hansen, who was NASA's lead climate science modeler, come testify in front of Congress, in front of his congressional committee. And Hansen, this is 1988, said, I can detect that global warming has started. And nobody had ever said that in public ever before. It was always this, someday in the far future, global warming might start uh, because of CO2 going up. But it was always in a, in a real future tense. And there was Jim saying, it has now started and I've got the data to prove it. All of us doing the early <laughs> Earth system science thinking back then thought, Hansen's crazy. <laughs> he is nuts. 
he has really gone out on a limb. Well, guess what? Uh, by, by the year 2000, we looked back and could see the additional data and said, yeah, he was the first to truly detect it in the, particularly the global temperature record. And so it was about, well, I was working on this, these ideas of Earth system science with NASA from a purely ecological and, and carbon balance point of view. And then here comes this global warming issue starts to emerge. And it was, it was around 2000, I think, I gave my first public talk about global warming. And so starting from just my pure science activity in, um, in Earth System Science, then the global warming topic just kind of took over global scale science and to this day. And was it uh, controversial from the beginning then? No. When did it no. become controversial? It appears, looking backwards now, that the fossil fuel industry very, well, in the beginning, right there, in start, the 1980s is when global scale science got going, the big global climate models, where the first generations of those were coming along, the computers were getting big enough, new satellites were going up, and so the whole global scale science was just getting established in the 1980s. And at the time, everybody was just looking at this as just new science. And there was no political tinge to it at all. I think now, and there's been books written about this, so I'm not just making, making this up speculatively, it's when the fossil fuel industry started to get nervous and they started to build a climate denier disinformation um, activity that it politicized. And now we're tracing back, now there's lawsuits. Exxon is being sued right now for uh, giving false uh, financial information and they may end up hanging over this uh, in the long run because I think that's when it was politicized. When they started trying to push back and say the science is wrong and the science is uncertain and these scientists are all just in it to get rich and all this stuff that now you hear all the time. Yeah, that, that's the one I like the most. They fly around with their corporate Lear jets. They claim that we're out to get rich as I come over here in my super. <laughs> um, and so I think that is explicitly when the politicization started. And so that would have been through the mid-90s on. And, and the year 2000 was another big IPCC assessment, the one before ours. And so that was when there was really the latest summer of the science, and it was starting to become really clear by then. And by then, they had this disinformation campaign going like mad. And there's been books written about this. That, that some of you are nodding your head. You've probably read some of these books where they've now traced back clearly that they followed the, the way they did with the tobacco, the, the tobacco lobby that pushed back on tobacco successfully for a few decades before the facts finally overwhelmed them. Well, they did the same thing with climate. So along those lines then, today um, we wanted to talk about how to have difficult discussions and how to have civil debate if it's possible. Um, so what do you say to the deniers or the skeptics? Can you present science? Does Do facts work? Do you go on the emotions? <laughs> have you had success at all? <laughs> facts are not facts, ask Rudy Giuliani. Um, for a while, facts mattered. <laughs> they don't any. For a while, I would so say starting in 2000, um, there when I'd give climate talks, 
it was mostly here's the newest data, here are the facts, here's what our satellites are measuring, our, our Greenland ice sheet data is measuring, our ocean warming is, our ocean temperatures are measuring. And so it was purely just here's the facts. And I think back then, there were people that listened to the facts and said, okay, yeah, I get it. I, I understand the, the physics. I understand that all these measurements are being taken and they're real, and so now I get it. I think by now, the facts have been out for so long that simply talking facts to an audience anymore isn't very valuable. Most anybody paying any kind of attention has heard the facts and they've either decided they're real or they've gone down into the denier rabbit hole, mm -hmm. one or the other. Um, probably the most valuable sociological study on all this that, that has been ongoing since about 2006 comes out of George Mason University in Yale and it's called the Global Warming Six Americas. Any of you ever heard of it? Okay, the Six Americas, what they did was polling of uh, voting age adults uh, in, into you know, how much they believed and didn't believe the climate change topic. And what they ended up doing is being able to identify six pretty clear populations uh, that all of us fit into one of these six bins. And of course, there's the raging deniers on one end, there's my crowd on the other end, and then there's varying stages of understanding but less motivation about what to do. But what I found really interesting and, and important in that, and I think important now, is something like a third of the adult population is just plain disengaged. They don't pay any attention. They don't watch the news, which you can't blame them anymore for that. Uh, but they, they don't know anything about current events. I have some adults in my own extended family that fit this entirely. And they're not bad people. They just don't choose to pay any attention uh, to uh, particularly current events. I like to think that they live in a life bubble. And anything in their bubble they pay attention to, but anything outside their bubble, they don't. And so my, my thought nowadays, uh, based on understanding this, is first the raging deniers, there's no use talking to. They're not interested in facts. They're, they're not interested in facts. So, so there's no use talking to them, but they're only about 10%. And they make a lot of noise because they've been funded under the table to make noise mm -hmm. and to send in op-eds to newspapers all over the country and, and uh, do all sorts of denier sphere uh, activities. They're only about 10%. Um, the ones that are more in this middle that don't have a strong opinion one way or the other and just aren't paying attention are the ones that you would think maybe you could get to pay attention. And, uh, and to me, those are the, the part of the, the population that uh, you like to hope we can make some progress. And having said that, the polls now show about 70% of Americans understand this is real. So it's actually a strong majority. They have different opinions of how aggressively we should respond, but they all understand the science is real and that this is, this is all well underway. And that sometime or other humanity better get thinking about what to do. So uh, it sounds like the facts don't matter anymore. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, but if facts don't matter, then do stories matter? Because I, I read one quote, and it, I could be getting the dates wrong here, but it, it was a Missoulian story. You were quoted as saying, likely Missoula won't have snow by 2035, and Bozeman won't have snow by 2050. Right? Which makes you gasp. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to prove it. That's right. And there'll be no snow. Jim said there'd be no snow. <laughs> are that, um, is that, are, 
first of all, are those dates still accurate for your prediction? Well, and, let's, I'm not sure <coughs> what interview you quoted. <laughs> so, uh, for, the first thing I, I want to say is, of course, facts do matter sooner or later because they're real. And so this current world of, of fact-free life is, is going to end up coming down someday. And different facts on, 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 different, uh, on different things uh, will kick in, whether people choose to believe it or not. I mean, this is the natural world in action. Um, I think... I think what we're already seeing is our winters getting shorter, our winters getting less extreme. Uh, talk to your grandparents about what it was like 50, 60 years ago. Uh, Montana could still have temperatures of minus 30 and minus 40 degrees. We haven't seen anything like that in decades. And so we know from the statistics, just looking at weather records, that winters are warming faster than summers, that the absolute minimum temperatures are coming up faster than summer maximum temperatures are changing. And so this is just a, a matter of what we're already seeing. Um, you know, 40 below wasn't that much fun. And so uh, you know, I don't want to make a value judgment of whether this is good or bad. This is just the statistics. And, it, and it's the kind of thing that global warming physics would, would predict from theory. Um, what we're probably going to see, and we may be on the way to seeing it this, this uh, winter, is on the, on the warmest, driest winters, you know, we're still going to have all sorts of normal natural variability. These last two winters, we forget, have been exceptional. And so if you start thinking the last two winters were normal, no, they're not normal. They're above normal, and, and, and particularly snowfall. So uh, on, I remember 10, 12 years ago, a few winters where I hardly even had to sweep my driveway the whole winter. There'd be like two or three little two-inch snowfalls the entire winter. And so on those really warmest, driest winters, of which we might be partway through one right now, we're certainly going to be where we don't have much snow and it melts off early. Mm -hmm. That still won't be the, the average winter for another 60, 80 years, but it's certainly going to be possible, which I think in the past wasn't really even possible. I'd like to open it up to the audience. What questions do you all have? Make it, make some easy ones first. <laughs> 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 to kind of get that momentum going. <laughs> really like questions, and much of it is sort of going off what you're saying with this whole, like, there's 10% of, 10% um, are kind of the raging climate deniers. And maybe other people have ideas, but how do we um, sort of curb this momentum that the media has of like focusing on those people and creating these really sensational stories? Because we find it so fascinating, right? That no one, that like, how could someone deny climate change like that? Um, any ideas on how? Well, we one of the things that it's good you bring that up to remind me to comment on it. Um, one of the things the denier sphere very quickly, one of their tactics was to hammer on journalists to give both sides of the story, as they called it. And it took journalism a long time to finally realize they were take, getting taken to the cleaners on that. That uh, there may be both sides to the story in some topics, but in other topics there's facts and there isn't anything else but the facts. <laughs> And so journalism is belatedly, after about 20 years now, starting to, to realize that uh, giving equal airtime to this, these just diatribes of bullshit um, is, is not serving the public well at all. And, um, and so that's changing 
And that's been acknowledged and is, is changing bit by bit. Um, one of the things that I guess particularly given the, the creativity focus of this group that I've come to understand is the people that relate to graphs and data <coughs> will come to the, my talks and, and see the graphs and data and say, yes, I get it. But then there's a whole other set of people that just, their mind just did not connect to graphs and data. And, and then it'll be something else. And probably the best example is every single one of us have seen these images of a polar bear standing on a tiny little ice floe. Well, for some people, that simple image is more important than the 2,000 page IPCC report that they never read. But that image, they said, oh my God, now I get it. And so it's helped me as a scientist to understand that uh, for, for a, a good number of our adult population, they don't do well with graphs and figures, but the right imagery, or I, I work with people writing songs. Uh, the, the right type of other kind of creative expression of the issue is going to be more valuable to, to some people than a bunch of graphs and data. You need to be, you need to control this. Um, what percentage of scientists that you've worked with do you think have this real faith in facts? That all I have to do is give people the facts and that will change their minds? About, about all of them. That's why we're scientists, is we think it's the facts that matters. And if we generate the good facts, we're, we've done our job. And it's interesting because it seems like it's a faith. <laughs> like it's irrational, the belief in the fact that the facts will change it. And so. Is there anything being done to help these scientists? <laughs> help these scientists. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm sure you'll laugh is we used to imagine that we'd lay out the facts and national policy would change the next year. That the politicians would say, oh, is that it? And boy, they'd be off passing laws following our fine facts. And, and now it's, if you look very closely, you being the scientist, you realize that we're just one voice amongst many on all sorts of topics. And that even though there we're the ones that generate the facts, we're not the ones that drive the policy and the politics of any of these kind of topics. And so, yeah, we're not very good at dealing with that yet. Because since we all thought the facts were what mattered, we're learning more and more how little that is true. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm trying to figure out because you had mentioned Amy about um, what is better is it, is it the story mm -hmm. rather than the facts? Because the facts do scare a lot of people, and then yeah. there's that overwhelming feel as well. You know, can't turn the ship around, so yeah. might as well just go out and get my range ready. Yeah. No, I, and, and I think for for this, if, first off. Everyone loves to hear stories, interesting right. stories. And so even scientists like interesting stories. <laughs> and, I, and I think that we're at a point now, as I said, where the people that relate to the hard facts and numbers have seen them. And for the people that can't relate to that, we've got to find different ways to get them engaged and motivated. And storytelling of interesting, fun stories with a nice message subtle message of doing the right thing is probably going to be really important for for a lot of people to get them interested and hopefully engaged in helping helping out. I have a question about HARP. I'm not registering HARP. what HARP, HARP, HARP is. HARP is? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, well, the actual, it's the research facility in, in Alaska? This when I go, gosh, how can there be so much information out there and then it could be all just a host? It's a high frequency active auroral research program. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, they measure the aurora borealis. Well, but it also had the, in the, in the creation of it was to create 
create different weather patterns? And is that something that the government is actually doing or not? I've never heard, when you say create different weather patterns, you're implying direct weather <laughs> modification. But they've done things like cloud seeding for right. a long time. Right. But I've never heard of anybody up in high latitudes imagining they're going to change weather in any big way. I've never once read about that. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, so we, all, we work in education. Um, and, you know, climate change is now a hot topic. Um, we work with water education, so it's a hot topic. We're trying to get stuff out there. But our challenge is, one, our partners, many of our partners, not all, around the U.S., can't use the word of climate change. And so we can't get it into classrooms with that term. So we're finding other terms, you know, to get it in there. And then the second part of that is, is it too late to, to be thinking about elementary school kids or middle school kids? Do we really need to be focusing this education more on adults and changing adult behavior? So I guess the terminology and then also age programs. I've given up on the adults. <laughs> it is the kids that are the ones totally we should be spending time with. The adults that are willing to do something are already trying. And I, I overstated that a bit, but I'm I'm afraid that the faster my generation just can get sent off with their fishing poles, the better. <laughs> and so I I think working with the the kids and uh, and just showing them matter-of-factly what's happening in the world. And of course, with young kids, you don't want to make it too scary. Um, I mean, really, we don't know how this is going to play out. And so I cringe myself at some of the scare statements I read from climate scientists. Uh, I think uh, social science is, as shown us over and over again that very few people are positively motivated by scare tactics. Mm -hmm. A few are, but most of the rest of us kind of shrink back and then try to ignore it and, you know, I can't hear you sort of thing. And so uh, I think uh, having kids learn the basics uh, at a very early age is, is the best thing to be doing now. And, and of course, yeah, the, the, the whole label of global warming, uh, you, can, you can translate to climate variability or weather trends if you want to use something like that, and you're virtually talking semantically about the same thing. And so I think there's been ways to, to avoid the label and still talk about the science. Um, so probably many of us have, and I know I do, have friends that um, they acknowledge that there's climate change, but the source of it, they are adamant. It's just this natural cycle that has happened throughout, you know, mm -hmm. life, and yeah. and are totally in yeah. denial. and Think that it's all been manufactured to. You know, make scientists rich. Yeah. Make, yeah, to make scientists, to make scientists rich. We know your we know your Porsches out there. We we know. Yeah. That. So, um, what is a what what is a good way of still trying to stay friends with those people, no. <laughs> which gets harder and harder. What because these are big topics and. Yeah. And I'm so adamant on my side, and they're so adamant yeah. on their side. Well, the first thing I'll do is give you a website that I think is the single oh, best okay. website for clearly identifying all the standard climate denier arguments and presenting a very concise uh, factual summary. And it's called skepticalscience.com. Okay. Skeptical, Skeptical Science. Skeptical. And, uh, it actually was started in Australia years ago. And they list all the arguments like that okay. and say, okay, here's the reality. Okay. Because in that particular one, in fact, the climate denier world fought like mad. Well, their, their, their going in argument up to about five years ago was that there is no warming going on. Well, when it got so overwhelming, they couldn't 
hold that uh, idea, then their backup is, has now become this. Is right. Yes, it's warming, but humans aren't causing it. Right. I could go into lots of details about stable isotope analysis, blah, blah, yeah, blah, right. of why we know exactly where this CO2 is coming from. Volcanoes are not a big enough source, for example. Uh, the sun is not getting brighter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, the climate scientists that look at this know damn well exactly where this is coming from. But that gets deeper into the hard science than most people want to try to process this. And so... Um, Does that category of people fit in that 10% or is that another... No, they're, they're, those are normally the next block up. Right. Yeah. Uh, the raging deniers, there's no logical discussion at all. These people are at least one step of trying to pay attention right. to logical science. So they're kind of the next bin up. And um, I guess about all you can say briefly uh, is that the scientists have, have looked at solar intensity change mm -hmm. and know for a fact that it's not getting stronger, which is one of their, their arguments. Right, right. The second one are natural CO2 sources like volcanoes mm -hmm. and uh, they measure that inside and out and know that it's like 0.1% yeah. of the CO2 emissions per year come mm -hmm. from volcanoes. And so about all you can say briefly is the sources of possible natural variations are studied every bit as much as the warming trends themselves. Thank you. Right. Thanks for the website. <laughs> Um, there's a TV show called Montana Ag Live, and I, I guess I'm about to publicly admit that I watch that sometimes. <laughs> and they did a whole thing on climate change, and it was a call-in show, and they said the only question we will not respond to is, why do you think this is happening? But in the bottom line for them, they said it doesn't matter why it's happening, we have to deal with uh, it's, you know, impacts on crops, pest management, all of these things, yeah. and they proceeded to have an hour-long amazing yeah. Discussion and just taking yeah. the one thing off the table. And that was a really good strategy for them to do. Yeah. Is is with a farmer and, and ranching audience that their livelihood depends on the weather and trends in the weather. Um, let's leave the the political hot potato behind and just say how are we going to react to right. current trends. Now I, I guess the one other source that a lot of you may not know has just been finished in the last year is a new Montana climate atlas. And it has all the st statistics of the, uh, the trends in, in <coughs> precip and for the state from the last 50 years. And it was done as a, as a joint work with MSU and U of M. Kathy Whitlock, <coughs> some of you might know, here at MSU was the leader on the MSU side. And so it's on the Montana Climate Office website. And it just gives the numbers of how much it's warmed up in various parts of the state, whether it's warmed up in the spring or in the fall, whether there's trends in summer rainfall, all that, they just crunch the numbers. And so for, for people that can leave the politics behind just like that and say, well, well what, what, what are the trends we're actually seeing now? That's a brand new, really well done source, and you can go see what the current Montana trends are. Okay, um, and jumping off the last two questions, um, and getting back to um, civil discourse and civil debate, are there go-to methods that you use, like empirically, like mental models or conversational models, to reframe the conversation so it can take out that element of divisiveness? To, I mean, because sometimes when you say presenting the facts isn't enough because people want to hear the facts. Yeah. So how do you get for discourse, or do you have a reframing model? Well, there's a couple of things that, depending on who I'm talking to and what level of interest they have in factual. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll do sometimes 
is try to parse out the, the question. So a perfect example, um, when they asked Trump um, if he believed the science in the latest national climate assessment, this came out of Thanksgiving, and they asked him and he said, I don't believe it. And you probably all heard that quote. Well, if, if I was stuck in a room with him for an hour uh, and on this topic, what I would try to do is, is parse that out and say, okay, what, it, what is it that you're referring to? Um, do you believe that CO2 is going up in the atmosphere? And then you can show them, we'll see, we know for sure it's going up in the atmosphere. Do you believe that, that uh, the temperatures are rising? And, and so you take it piece by piece. I've seen this so many times where particularly the raging deniers just wave their hand and say, I don't believe any of it. For at least a few of them, if you can pin them down on some of the real specifics, they probably won't admit it to your face, but it might cause them to quietly later reassess what they think they, they know and, and believe. Uh, another thing that I pay attention to, which probably isn't so relevant to you all, but it is to me, is, is a lot of what we project, well, everything that we project into the future is based on computer models. Well, some people just kind of categorically don't believe computer models. And uh, there's some good reason to be skeptical. I'm a computer modeler myself. But I find with people that push back on that, and in fact, in my talks, I try to go directly to the weather station records and say, this is not a model. This is the, the, the temperature records that were taken right out of the Bozeman airport. And so you hammer away that this isn't computer modeling uh, to look at the current trends. These are the direct observations of, of routine weather. And so that'll help. Another thing I try to do with certain audiences, and by audience it sometimes is individuals, is that they're too hung up on the climate part alone, is, is I talk about related issues, like, uh, you know, like the, the Great Pacific garbage patch in the ocean, for example, or some of the other in related environmental uh, issues that we know are drivers, part of the drivers of climate change, but aren't the climate specifically. Um, yeah, I guess those are some of the things I try to do to get away from you know, just banging heads on, on the global warming science over and over. How much of this do you think is um, related back to the lack of understanding of what climate really is, too? Because you know, there's the weather versus climate, and yeah. some people are like, well, last winter we got so much snow, yeah. so clearly there's no yeah. thing, you know, there's no change. It's like, well, okay, but weather and climate, there's a difference. Yeah. And that is the, num the second slide in all my public talks, after my title slide, is what is the difference between weather and climate? And so, that, a lot of people get hung up on that, and they say, yeah, we did yesterday. <coughs> How can there be kind of global warming? And, and so you just, you want to point out two things. Is one, you're only talking about Bozeman. I'm talking about a global scale dynamic. And you're only talking about yesterday, and I'm talking about a decadal to century dynamic. And so that is, that is uh, a confusion that people need to think through. And the minute you give them some examples, they, they get it, I hope. <laughs> uh, but it, it's a it's a point of confusion that you want to be ready to give them some examples that you know the fact that it didn't snow yesterday or it did snow or it doesn't matter to climate because it's global and long term. So I kind of get the argument that oh climate isn't really changing they just weren't keeping record now we're keeping records oh then they weren't so kind of tied into hers but how. Yeah. How do you help repeat that? Well, there's no doubt that, that, that the amount of data dramatically increased right after World War II. But 
particularly things like temperature and precip records are pretty simple measurements that they started back in the 1850s. And there weren't thousands of stations, but there were enough stations. And so that, that one is, uh, well, it's been well looked at by the climatologists for decades to see if there's any kind of an of a, um, anomaly uh, being generated by the changing, uh, changing number of stations, the changing quality of the sensors. I mean, there's techno geeks that just love to crawl over that stuff. It drives me nuts. <laughs> well, they do. So, as like an individual who's been working in the industry for a long time, Right? So, like, what are the things that we can do to change our lives and then influence the people around us directly? And I want to add on to that. Is it, can individuals make meaningful changes to actually help with this issue? And or is it about changing Well, it kind of reminds me of, I don't know when this bumper sticker emerged a long time ago, think globally, act locally. Um, there's no doubt that each one of us are are a, 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 a tiny fraction of the problem. And um, I, I think uh, what I see first is we, we, we first want to be, we first want to understand the issue. And I think the fact that you, you all came here today means that some of you are already working on is understanding the issue. I, I think the second thing that uh, the social scientist uh, can illustrate with examples forever is that in every society there's thought leaders and early adopters and <coughs> leaders uh, in whatever activity might be going on and in this particular activity I, I mean just leading by example is what it boils down to when I put solar panels on my house Four or five of my neighbors came by and wanted to talk about solar panels. And if I hadn't put those on, they probably wouldn't have. And now, one by one, the houses on our block are all putting solar panels on. Um, when, I, when I got my wife an electric car, people started asking, what's the deal with these electric cars? And, and, and so there's a multiplier effect from these early adopters that uh, innovation people have understood for years. A small number of early adopters uh, end up propagating with good ideas, and I suppose sometimes bad ones. Those early adopters, the rest of this uh, community sees. And uh, if they really are thought leaders of the community, then, then uh, they start following. And, uh, and so you can go down the list of everything uh, recycling and uh, you know, all, all the things that you probably all are aware of and probably already do and what you maybe don't notice is how many of your neighbors are probably watching you. I rode my bike. I commuted on my bike my whole life. She almost squashed me many times. She tells me now, uh, going up on my bike and I learned how many people notice there's running the climate change riding this bike mm -hmm. to work? And the slush and snow. Yeah, and some of the days were kind of bad. But to me, it was just something I chose to do. I actually like bike riding anyway. <laughs> so I was kind of happy that it turned out to be such a socially cool thing. <laughs> but lots and lots of people. I found out later, particularly when I retired and suddenly I wasn't out there, uh, noticed. Somebody did? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're actually going to wrap up with that. Um, so thank you so much. We have the room for another 20 minutes. So if you need to take off, take off. If you want to hang out and talk with Steve, please. Continue hanging out. Yep. You figure Missoula and Bozeman are kind of the thought leaders of the state. You know, this is a good example where beyond individual at a community level, it's communities like Bozeman and Missoula that should be leading the way of things like new building design. You know, I was reading about this library right out here, the building we're And so 
And I know I've stayed in the fancy new hotel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hotel, yeah. I stayed in there, and and uh, and those are those are steps forward in the way you're suggesting it. And I guess what's so sad is how long it takes to make it. Well, you can talk to those. Dude, we can't do it here in Bozeman. How do we expect it in a national level? Right. Well, and, and this is as I watch. The, the clean energy revolution. I see that the university towns are tending to be the leaders in, uh, in uh, uh, pushing some of these new technologies. What's interesting is we don't really need any technology breakthroughs in building. You've got the tools already around. Um, there's there is an amazing amount of inertia in the construction industry. Are you hopeful for a future? And yeah. Um, um, <laughs> it's easy to not be. That's for sure. Let me say a couple of things. First, it kind of bothers me that in a lot of the press. They talk about we only have 12, year, 12 years left, yeah. or we only, you know, if we can't stop at uh, one and a half degrees, we're doomed. Uh, and, you know, that's a strategy by some people thinking to scare the world into wising up. And unfortunately, as social science has shown all too often, that doesn't motivate people uh, all that well. Uh, the, the other thing is there's definitely going to be winners and losers, and, and I mean that in terms of, of uh, economic sectors. You can all guess some of the sectors that are going to lose, the coal industry being the first. Um, and then there's going to be winners that are emerging slowly. Um, the other thing that, that I look at a lot is geographically. There's going to be parts of the world that actually do okay in parts of the world that are really doomed. And I actually think that this northwestern part of the country is better chance of doing better than a lot of the rest of the country. As long as the water issues are okay. The wa water for us is the big issue. Water and wildfire are really the two things we've got to be ready to deal with. But beyond that, I think I would rather be here than Key West, Florida. That's <laughs> we're really up and down the hurricane. But then there will be a real issue with climate, so I mean, Oh, for sure. And that's going to get quite interesting as we move into the future. I guess oceanfront property down on the Carolina coast is already starting to drop in value as little by little uh, the current owners are realizing that if they wait too long, they have a completely valueless property and let's sell out quick to somebody that's not paying as much attention. And so I, I, I think we're in a better place than much of the rest of the country to be still in a very nice, comfortable world even a hundred years from now. But don't tell anybody that. <laughs>